Welcome back to the second part of our module two in human resource management. In the first lecture, we talked a lot about the actual recruitment process. And in this section, we're gonna talk about selecting from that applicant pool that we have recruited. So if we take a, a closer look at selection, we recognize that it is this process of selecting uh, and somebody or a group of people from a larger pool of applicants that we have decided are qualified for the position. Typically, we've asked our applicants to send in a cover letter, possibly also a resume or curriculum vitae, depending on their industry, and, and occasionally some um, evidence of their prior work. Like in my case, it would be things like student evaluations or publications. So uh, we narrow that down based on who is actually qualified or not qualified. And then we begin the process of bringing them in for interviews in order to choose who is the best qualified and the best fit for our organization and the goals of our organization. So it's more than just choosing somebody who can do the job, it's choosing somebody who matches the people in our organization, our organizational culture, and the vision and mission that our organization is seeking to fulfill. It's a very important process, and you can see that I put a quote in here or a paraphrase from your book, that top performers actually contribute between five and 22 times more value to the companies than low or average performers. This is particularly important as we look to increase productivity in our organizations and quality of performance. If, from my perspective as an HR professional, if I had to choose one aspect of the entire HR management process that I think is the most critical, it would be the actual recruitment and selection particularly the selection of an applicant into your organization. If you do this properly and take a lot of time, it can also help reduce the number of problems that you have down the road. If the individual is well suited to the job, the culture and the organization, you often will find that because of that good fit, there are fewer issues in terms of discipline or conflict or tensions in the workplace. So I mentioned that we start with the resume typically in our um, evaluation of applicants. Um, if you are applying for jobs, one of the things that you want to do is look at the job posting and pull out some key words and phrases that you think are appropriate uh, for this particular job. Electronic software is often used now, particularly by larger companies, to scan resumes, and it will look for uh, certain elements of a resume. For instance, it will look for required elements like a degree or a certification or something like that. The other thing it will look for are keywords that signal that you have knowledge and the language of the position for which you're applying, as well as key um, characteristics that the organization is looking for. Some of these keywords, some of the, um, the ones that I recommend for modern um, contemporary organizations are phrases that indicate pro uh, innovative problem solving, creative decision making, team building, leadership, um, collaboration, um, anything that demonstrates adaptability in today's world I think is very important. Once we narrow it down based on the information we have, we set up a, a number of interviews for the applicants to come in in which we can extend our search and evaluation of each individual candidate. The interviews should absolutely be goal oriented. We need to know exactly what we're looking for and what information we're trying to gather from the interview. Otherwise, it can end up being um, less useful. So I know that from my experience and um, in HR and in general management, that a lot, this is true, the second bullet point, that a lot of organizations place more emphasis on the actual interview than they do any other part of the process. So we've determined pretty much at this point when we bring them in for an interview, that they are skilled enough to do the job. And we got that information from primarily the information that they sent us, including the resume. 
at this point now, we really want to make sure that they're a good fit and that everything we saw is validated. So in terms of the actual interview itself, some of the items that we will explore are their occupational experience and not just that they have time served in an industry or in a job. What we're really looking at is the experience they have in which they've gone over and above average. For me, when somebody lists that they have five years on the job in a particular job, all that signals to me is that they did a good enough job not to get fired. There's nothing exceptional about maintaining your position in a job for five years, except perhaps that you have stick to itness. So in your resumes, when you telegraph your experience, make sure that you include items of accomplishment, things that you did that were over and above what you needed to do in the job, because we are looking for exceptional, not average. Some other aspects that you might look at, depending on the job, are academic achievement, this um, and certifications in certain areas, those types of things. And this is really industry specific. It's interpersonal skills are very important because this helps us identify people who get along well in the workplace, uh, not just with coworkers, but also if the individual will have contact with the outside world, whether it's vendors or other professionals in the industry or with customers. And lastly, we look at the individual and how well they will fit in with our organization. Are they driven by some of the same motivators that will help us meet our, our goals in terms of an organization? One of the methods used in interviews, uh, interviewing is something we call a, an unstructured interview. Um, it typically will ask probing open-ended questions and uh, the interviewer does very little talking and one of the things I have discovered in interviews is that if you are quiet, people will fill the space. So it's an effective way of getting people to talk. Sometimes, however, because it's so open-ended, it's not well um, directed, and you may get a lot of information that doesn't really matter to you or doesn't have anything to do with the job. It can be really time-consuming because people tend to go down a lot of rabbit trails and unfortunately, in this kind of interview, because it is so, um, not, it's not managed at all, you run a high risk of applicants um, giving you information that could be perceived as discriminatory. So for instance, if you ask an applicant to tell them, to tell you something about themselves, they may begin by their um, discussing their, how important their faith is to them, for instance, or how many children they have. And this is just an area that I highly recommend not going down. Here are some examples of those types of questions. I mentioned, tell me about yourself. Strengths and weaknesses are another. Um, th these are poorly designed questions and uh, majority of employers ask them. I think if you wanna ask something like this and in terms of an open-ended question and we know the applicants are ready to receive them, it's to slightly alter the question to say, what do you perceive as your greatest strength at work or in the workplace? Um, a better way of phrasing it in my view is, I usually ask applicants, how would your coworkers describe you at work? How would your supervisor describe you and your contribution at work? Um, what kinds of feedback have you gotten on your performance evaluations? Because these are more job related and that's really what you wanna get at. You wanna stay away from personal information and again, if it's too open-ended, you may end up in an area, they might start talking about their age, which is not a good thing. So uh, I would recommend putting together some thoughtful questions. Uh, uh, contrary to the unstructured interview is something that uh, we call a structured or directed interview. And these are a series of job-related questions asked of each applicant. So in other words, if you have you interview five applicants, all five applicants will be exa asked exactly the same question. You can do follow-up if they give you a very brief answer. You can explore that a little bit farther to get more information. But one of the things that is so important about this is that if an applicant wishes to uh, file some sort of grievance against you that you discriminated against them in some way, you have clear proof that you've asked the same questions of all applicants, they're job related and not personal, 
to that individual. So it helps a lot in terms of getting the right information and also keeping the interview on track. Uh, some uh, things that you might ask in these um, structured interviews, and by the way, this is the type of interview that I do, I ask a lot of situational questions that are job related. So for instance, um, if I'm interviewing a nurse, I might ask them what they would do given a certain situation with the patient. Um, if I'm interviewing um, a call center employee, I may a uh, throw a difficult situation at them and ask them to role play with me or to respond in how they would handle it. Job knowledge questions. Um, so I know that in medicine, we often ask questions about um, uh, particular disease processes and, and how folks would handle that. Um, and, and again, um, we can look at the job description and the skills that are needed and take our questions from there. And this is often where if you're an HR person, this is a great place to have a uh, employer manager in that field, in that area, help give you a detailed idea of what they do all day long. There are some, many employers will also ask applicants to perform certain tests. And I think this sends up a, a red, red flag and I think that more and more often we're seeing less of the types of tests that you see on the screen, particularly personality tests. It just depends. Um, skill tests are something that are still performed. For instance, if I'm hiring somebody to draw blood, I might ask them to actually demonstrate drawing blood um, so that I can see they can actually do it. Uh, personality tests are often given for um, jobs where they're uh, high stress jobs. So if you apply for a position, say with the police department or fire department, you may find there, um, there may be some personality tests um, questions in the pre-employment test. And these are more geared to make sure that um, you don't have a violent tendency or some other type of emotional disturbance that would prevent you from being able to handle stressful situations. You have to be really, really careful about all of these tests. And um, in most jobs, I would say that you would not necessarily need them. And this is a, a good place to involve an employment law attorney. Physical tests are another thing that, that folks will often do to make sure that they can actually do the job. And um, this is separate from, say, a, a physical exam. It's showing that you can, that you know how to do the job and that you can do it. Um, physical exams, as I mentioned, are also something that um, employers will ask of certain employees. And be, be cautious when you do this that you are giving the same tests and the same exams of all people in this particular area or job classification. And that the exams, regardless of what they are, remember, should be job related. Everything you do in this process should be job related. And you wanna be able to tie that back in case you are ever questioned about your motives. Some of the interviewing problems that folks get into are, are really interesting. I've spent years doing interviews um, and I have trained a lot of, of um, HR folks in terms of interviewing and, and managers and how to interview. And it's some of the patterns that we're going to talk about are, are, are um, there and, and you'll see them. There, these are some things that you should be cautious about as an interviewer. We often will have a first impression and we know the first impressions are really important. And, and that's something to take into consideration, but you don't want to discount the rest of the interview based on the first couple of minutes with an applicant. Um, I have been surprised on occasion where somebody came in and they were so nervous that I thought they could not um, interact in the manner that was needed in the job. But once they were at ease and I realized it really had to do with the situation, I ended up hiring a couple of those people and they ended up being excellent employees. So be careful. Um, also, interviewers get a little cocky and we seem to think that we can read a candidate whether or not they're um, a great candidate or not. And I will say that I am one of those 
interviewers who has done it long enough that I feel like I have a pretty good uh, read, but I never, never rely on that because I have been proven wrong. So be careful. Be careful that you don't um, believe in yourself too much. And that's one of the reasons I use structured interviews. It's one of the reasons why I do reference checks that do your due diligence and, and check your ego and check your feelings at the door. In selecting new employees, there are some things that you want to be cautious about in the interview when it is rushing through because it's very time consuming. Take your time. As I mentioned, if you do nothing else well, select your employees well. Spend time on this one part of your HR management job. Um, stereotyping is something we something that we do. Stereotyping is not always negative, but for instance, even the way somebody walks in, the way they're dressed in an interview, we will make an immediate assessment about them. And as an applicant, if you're applying for a job, I would say absolutely dress the way you expect others in this uh, field to dress. However, as an interviewer, you want to get beyond that. Make a note of it, but get, get beyond it, and try not to stereotype their entire interview based on one, one detail. Uh, a syndrome that I've seen a lot of in interviewing are managers in particular who don't have a lot of interviewing experience. If they find an, uh, an applicant who's very much like them, they feel that this is just the greatest employee ever. They feel like they've been friends forever and they want to work with this person and they would be perfect. In many cases, they can't do the job, but uh, be careful of that. And another thing, you want to make sure that they fit the work group, not that they would work well with you because chances are you may not work with them ever, particularly if you're in human resources. The halo and horn effects are taking one thing that you see in an employee and having it overshadow everything else. So for instance, if an employee comes, or an applicant, excuse me, comes in and they talk to you about their volunteer work and you just think it's so over the top and this really calls out to you that they are now the perfect candidate and you, you don't listen carefully to anything else they say. Likewise, let's say you hate the color yellow and they come in dressed in yellow. And, and so everything they say you discount. I know that sounds foolish, but those are some um, examples, extreme examples, but we do this. So again, be objective and everything that you process, continue to think in terms of whether or not it's job related and organizationally related. Uh, and don't get forced into making a decision if you don't have a good selection. This is very hard, I know, but in the long run, you'll be glad that you didn't. So another error that we often see in interviewing is the contrast effect. We know from our research that the, the order in which you interview can have a lot to do with your selection. And it's not whether you're third or fifth or first or last, but it's how you are placed in contrast to other individuals. So if somebody kind of stumbles to the interview and then you come in and do a really excellent job, you may appear to be even better of a candidate than you would otherwise if you had followed another excellent candidate. So again, remember to stick to your structured interviews. Think in terms of whether or not it's job related Focus on the person in front of you and everything they're saying. And, and focus not only on them and what they're saying, but how it, it relates back to the position for which you're hiring and the environment in which that person needs to work. Um, and lastly, I think sometimes at the end, we just want to be done. And so sometimes the last applicant does have a little bit of an advantage. I will also say that um, in one of my jobs, I was an employment officer in banking, and I interviewed all day long, five days a week, for a variety of statewide jobs. And there were times where I had to make notes along the way just to keep myself focused and uh, as far as remembering who these people were. Because um, if you do too much, it starts to blur. And make sure that you take notes and that you capture your, your final thoughts after each interview. Don't wait to the end of the day. So those are just some ideas on how to conduct a, a, a better interview. Moving on to post-interview, uh, 
uh, many jobs now perform uh, background checks. It depends on the industry and the job. I mentioned that I spent some time in banking and uh, background screening is very important. We also did it in healthcare because of uh, the confidentiality, but also we're dealing with people's lives. We needed to know that um, the people that we trusted, um, the care of our patients with, were people that did not have other legal issues or problems. Another area of investigation that you want to look at is to verify the things that the applicants are claiming both on their resume, on their documents, but also in the interview. That many, many applicants, the majority of applicants, lie on their, on their resumes and in their interviews. They expect that employers will not check these facts. And if you're not checking, you're hiring these people. So uh, in terms of reference checks, this leads us to this uh, area that provides a lot of frustration for me as a manager and an HR manager. People are no longer, companies are no longer giving reference checks as a, as a standard. They give name, rank, and serial number. And even though the laws of 37 states have, are shielding these employers from liability or harm based on um, job references. So in other words, if you say that this person had an attendance problem and you have an attendance record, this is not a problem. Even in states where there aren't laws, if you have documentation and you tell the truth, you're fine. Um, anybody can sue anybody in our world, right, in our country. Um, whether or not they're successful is another matter. It's also expensive and time consuming, and a company has far more resources than an individual to work through that process. So why companies do this, I think has less and less to do with their concern over being sued. I think that's one of the company lines. I think it's just the easy way out. It's a lot of work to go back and find this information and provide it to other people. So we'll see what happens. Um, there are two schools of thought in references. One is just um, don't tell them anything, name, rank, and serial number, and then you don't have to worry about it. However, um, in a minute, we'll talk about there are there is a backlash on that that you do have to be careful about. Um, my thought is that honesty is the best policy. I have given references for decades. I continue to do so. My reference checking has never come in. My um, the giving of references that I've done has never come into question. I always have documentation. I also have employees sign a form when they leave. Um, that allows me to give reference checks. I tell them on the form, here are the items that I will likely discuss, things like your performance evaluations, your attendance, etc. And if there is anything on here you don't wish me to discuss, then you should check that and then sign the form. If an employee refuses to allow me to give an employment reference on this form, then I simply tell their next employer, I'm sorry, I would happily give you a reference, but the employee former employee has asked that I not do so and I have a signed form. If you can allow them to release that, then I am happy to talk to you. Which of course is, does not give a very positive um, recommendation for that person. When I mentioned that we would talk about um, a backlash and not giving references, there's a concept called negligent hiring. And that's if um, I know that, say, an employee has, uh, has a violent temper and has had displayed violence in the workplace, and another company calls me for a reference check and I don't pass that on, and that person engages in violent activity and harms somebody in their new job, that company and that victim can sue me and will probably win it, I think, although I'm not an attorney, but I think that places us at great risk. So. I think we have to be careful about that. Another thing is not doing negligence in hiring has to do with not doing our due diligence. And that's something that means we have to look at an employee's background or an applicant's background and make sure that they don't, aren't going to be placed in a position where they can harm others. So hopefully that's given you an idea of how we can make a better selection as we hire our employees. And as I've said a few times throughout this, I think it's one of the most critical areas of HR management that you'll engage in. Thank you.